Welcome everyone. Good afternoon and good morning for those of you not on the East Coast. Um, my name is Nick Anderson and I'm the project director for American Roundtable. American Roundtable was created to bring together on the ground perspectives on the condition of American small to mid-sized communities and what they need to thrive going forward. The proposition at the heart of this initiative is that too often our understanding of rural areas and small cities is reduced to caricature and oversimplification. So our hope with this project is to highlight in all their complexity and nuance, communities often overlooked and to provide platforms for individuals and organizations to share their stories and work, imagining, understanding and improving their local built environments. At the core of American Roundtable has been a series of nine reports, each looking at a different community or region in the United States. All nine reports are now available on archley.org. In parallel, over the last few months, we have gathered each reports as editors and contributors for discussion, which brings us to today, the ninth and final program in this series of American Roundtable events. I don't wanna take any more time away from today's program. So I encourage you again to visit archleague.org to learn more about the entire initiative and to explore all nine reports. You can also find video recordings of previous roundtable presentations and discussions. This afternoon, we have the pleasure of learning more about Africatown, Alabama and the report, if we can save the ship, we can save the town. We will first hear from the report's lead editor, Renee Kemp-Rotan, and associate editor, Vicki Howell, and then a really exciting panel of scholars, Africatown residents, and civic leaders. Following their presentations, I'll be joined by Rosalie Ginevro, the League's executive director, for discussion. We do hope to take some questions from the audience at that time, so please add any questions to the Zoom Q&A feature. For the sake of time, I will keep formal speaker introductions very short. I encourage you to visit our website to learn more about our very accomplished panel. Renee Kemp-Rotan is an urban designer, master planner, and the CEO of Studio Rotan, a cultural heritage and civic design firm. She resides in Birmingham, Alabama, but is working closely with the Africatown community on a number of initiatives, including the Africatown International Design Idea Competition, for which she serves as the professional competition advisor. Vicki Howell is a mobile-based journalist, writer, PR strategist, and socially conscious community builder. She is currently the founder and president of MOVE, making opportunities viable for everyone, Gulf Coast Community Development Corporation. Dr. Kern Jackson is the director of the African American Studies Program at the University of South Alabama. His particular interest is in African American folklore and oral narratives. He is conducting ongoing research into Africatown's history through its oral history program. Jason Lewis grew up in Africatown before a career in the Navy. He is the founder of VETS, Visualizing Everyone That Serves, a community service organization that has organized service projects in Africatown among other communities. Darren Patterson is a journalist and Africatown community leader, currently serving as president of the Clotilda Descendants Association. He is a descendant of Polly Allen, one of Africatown's founders. Dr. Deborah G. Plant is an African American, African American and Africana Studies scholar and literary critic whose special interest is the life and works of Zora Neale Hurston. She served as the editor of Hurston's series of interviews with Africatown founder Cujo Lewis, published as the book Barracoon, The Story of the Last Black Cargo. Dr. Natalie S. Robertson is a scholar who has held a number of teaching and research appointments, including at Hampton University and the Smithsonian's National Museum of African Art. She is the author of The Slave Ship Clotilda and the Making of Africatown USA, Spirit of Our Ancestors. Ramsey Sprague is the president of the Mobile Environmental Justice Action Coalition. Sprague is an enrolled member of the Grand Cayu Dulac Band of the Biloxi Chitimaca Choctaw Tribe and lives in Mobile. And Joe Womack is an Africatown community leader and is the president and executive director of Africatown Chess, an environmental justice organization. And with that, I will turn things over to Renee and Vicki. Thank you for that very kind introduction. I wanna welcome my editorial team and I also wanna welcome members in the audience to this very special occasion. I guess over the last year, an editorial team for Africatown has been assembled. 
that looked at five topics uh, very, very deeply that affect the health, welfare, and safety of uh, Africatown. Those five topics that we explored include public space, public health, infrastructure, environment, and work and economy. And so because the topics were prescribed, one of the first things that I had to do as editor was really figure out who the editorial team was going to be. And I'm so very happy to have the team here today because half of the speakers are from the descendant community and are from Africatown and Mobile. And the other half of the editorial team are uh, scholars and subject matter experts. So it's been a wonderful convergence of boots on the ground, as well as all of the research that's gone on amongst the preeminent scholars uh, that we have with us. What I want to do is uh, get ready to share screen so that I can take you through our entire planning process in putting all of this information together. Okay, so we assembled as a team because everyone on the team really knows this place very, very well. So we as a group wanna say thank you to American Roundtable. And we also want to say thank you to the editorial team and thank you also audience uh, for joining us. You're in for quite uh, a treat. Uh, on the left, what you'll see is the list of topics that really has grown since the original in inception. Uh, we have produced almost a 200 page report on Africatown, we call it a case study. And these are the eight to nine chapters that are basically included uh, in the research. Uh, we were basically doing this so that we could accumulate a lot of quantitative information that we could literally give back to the citizens of Africatown as they go about a number of uh, community activist uh, obligations and responsibilities, dealing with zoning, dealing with challenges to environment and infrastructure. Now we all have this information all in one place. So we see uh, not only the opportunity of having done the research, but we've accumulated a very useful uh, resource manual for, uh, for the community. So these are the topics again, and this is the order of the program. If we can save the ship, we can save the town, history, the rubric, the racialization of uh, public space, Cujo Say I Cry, the Africatown Neighborhood Plan, Cultural Economics, Environment, Sites of Interpretation, the Spirit of Place, the Competition, and then two film clips, there is a poem in this, uh, in this place. How we got here. Uh, I got to Africatown basically because of this project, that's me with the circle around my face, when I was director of the uh, Birmingham Civil Rights Heritage Trail, and the tall woman right next to me is Vicki Howell. I hired Vicki to do the research for the trail sign, if there's one of the signs on the right, and that was our first uh, collaboration doing cultural heritage and civic engagement projects. Vicki is from Mobile and had it not been for Vicki, I would have never been invited uh, to the dance. So about three years ago, I was invited by Vicki Howell to come to Africatown and take a look at the history there. I had been in Alabama for 15 years and had never heard of Africatown until three years ago. So through uh, a series of visits to Africatown, I got to know the history very well. The first thing we have to do in introducing the subject is talk about how we got here from Africa. Basically, we're talking about an international slave trade that was made illegal after 1808 and a bet that was placed to see if 110 Africans couldn't be smuggled from the west coast of Africa into the Gulf of Mexico uh, and the Mobile uh, Delta. That ship was the Clotilda, and Africatown was born from that range of experiences, uh, from kidnapping to emancipation to naturalization to actually building the town. But I'm not the expert on the history. I'm going to turn that over to the author of The Last Ship, Clotilda, and the Making of Africatown. 
Natalie Robertson. She knows this history. Natalie? Thank you so much um, for that wonderful introduction to an amazing story that I am just so thrilled to be a part of. And as of next year, I would have been a part of for 30 years, um, which is just you know, amazing given the fact that um, this began really as my doctoral dissertation work at the University of Iowa in 1992, which is how I became interested in this story. And based upon a feasibility study that I conducted in 1992, I determined that Africatown was really a suitable topic for my dissertation. So I did pursue this history as a part of my dissertation work. Um, subsequently, it has taken me back and forth to Africatown several times and to three West African countries as well as to England in pursuit of data that would elucidate um, this story particularly as it relates to um, the route of the slave ship Clotilda. And I'm very much interested in the maritime history of this case. And particularly as it relates to the origins of these Africans, which is perhaps the most important question that most people will ask about this particular case of slave smuggling. So I have to say um, that it has been quite a journey um, since 1992. It's taken me um, across the Atlantic several times. It has introduced me to fascinating individuals on both sides of the Atlantic because of course the book is based really upon 50 interviews that I've conducted with descendants um, of the Africans who were smuggled into Mobile on the eve of the Civil War, as well as with descendants of the Africans who actually sold their ancestors into slavery um, in the slave port of Ouida in the Republic of Benin. So um, this has been um, a fascinating journey for me, um, and it's also been supported by numerous organizations, to mention a few, including the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, as well as UNCF Spelman College. Um, so what should everyone know about the slave trade, about Africa, and about Africa town? Well, of course, um, during the second half of the 19th century, when this case occurred, um, there were several Africans taken out of um, the Republic of Benin and dispersed to various places um, around the world so that the cargo um, the Clotilda cargo was comprised largely of Yoruba speaking Africans who were captured in southwestern Nigeria, but you also have a contingent of Africans who were captured in the central region of Nigeria as well. And then you have perhaps one or two Africans um, who came out of the Republic of uh, Benin itself. So um, the cargo was multilingual, uh, multicultural, as was most slave cargoes um, coming out of Africa. And um, they were also multi-talented in the sense that they arrived in the Americas endowed with technical skills, world views, um, folk traditions, folk ways, folk ideas, um, and religions that they actually drew on to 
establish their own communities in the Americas. Uh, heretofore, you know, people um, have been discussing the harshness of slavery as something that actually um, prohibited Africans from drawing on their uh, African heritages. I mean, the thought was up to a certain point that Af slavery was so harsh that it actually um, prevented Africans from applying their West African heritages in the Americas. I argue the contrary, um, that slavery was indeed so harsh that it forced the Africans to draw on the talents and the skills um, that they brought with them to the Americas. And that's exactly what the um, founders of Africatown did. So that Africa town itself is really a microcosm um, of Africa um, in the sense that it embodies um, particularly uh, particular West African um, Africanisms like agriculture um, that uh, people can really view and look at and learn a lot of important lessons from regarding what the Africans knew when they arrived in the Americas. So they brought their agriculture, they brought their religion, they brought their architectural um, and technical skills and herbal medicine to Africa town, making Africa town uh, a microcosm really of many of the African communities out of which they hail. So um, one of the important lessons that people should um, really learn about Africatown is that Africatown is an example of um, resilience in the face of adversity. Rather than succumbing to their victimization, um, their victimization was actually the catalyst, if you will, um, for the development of their own community um, in the face of seemingly insurmountable odds. So it is, you know, at once um, a symbol of African um, folk traditions, um, and it is a symbol of resiliency uh, as well. So um, we should really um, look at slavery, not only in terms of victimization. I mean, that is in fact one aspect um, of the Black experience in the Americas, but it's perhaps not even the most important aspect of the Black experience in the Americas. The most important aspect is the extent to which Africans like the Clotilda Africans drew on their African traditions in order to overcome their victimization. Thank you, Natalie. And this is why it's so important in all of this work that we make sure that we actively engage our Black scholars in the writing of Africatown's history at all of the interpretive sites. Our Black scholars, such as Natalie, have got to be at the table as this story begins to unveil itself in the public realm. This is a copy of the cover of Natalie's book, uh, Take Notes, Write It Down, and certainly buy and also read the book. Um, in addition to the history, the other important component of all of this work really has everything to do with what we call community engagement. We love the people of Africatown. I've been down there um, once a month and spent a week. And so I feel very close to the community. Uh, in community engagement, of course, we could talk about a couple of workshops here and there, but we really want to talk about um, the process that the National Trust endorses for the uh, engagement of community through the rubric that was written by um, archaeologist Michael Blakey. So I want Darren Patterson of the 110 Clotilde Association to tell us a few words about how the descendant community feels about Africatown's history. Thanks, Renee. Uh, every time I hear Dr. Robertson speak about, you know, her, her very uh, intimate 
understanding of what happened and how the descendants, my descendants got here, it, it makes me really, it really upsets me these days that people are trying to revise history. History is, is history. You cannot revise what happened. And what happened was 12 million people, the population of the state of Illinois were taken from their homes, their country and brought here. Uh, legislator uh, Robert Toombs in Georgia said, we we're gonna give them a better life. Say what? It, it just cannot be revised. Um, America wants to sanitize this history. The Descendants Association take it very seriously that our people were ferried here against their will in a cargo hole five by 20. Some of you have living rooms bigger than that. For a two month voyage through two hurricanes, butt naked, had to defecate, to eat where they defecated, sleep where they defecated, and you're trying to now sanitize history? That's not gonna happen. On our website, we have it very prominent and make it very clear that one of our missions, if not the biggest mission, is to never let the world forget what happened. Never let the world forget. We're not gonna do that. We will never let them forget what happened. Our people were doing fine by themselves and somebody decided to change their lives. We will not let that go. We will not let that change. We will not let people change that. Uh, it's such a joy right now to meet all of my cousins and, and uh, fellow descendants, some of them who are on this call today. And uh, we wanna make sure we want to make sure that what we are trying to do is preserve the legacy of the 110. They were remarkable people, like Dr. Robinson said. They were very intelligent people, far be it from what people here were told they were. They came here to be nothing but slaves. We were never intended to be anything but slaves. And that's the sad part of it. The three-fifths compromise. You know, they wanted to include us so that the Confederate States could get more representation, but they didn't give us the right to vote. So if people think 161 years later that the descendants are gonna sit back, watch you revise history, tell people that what happened didn't happen, you got another thing coming. And I have some very, very adamant descendants who are not gonna let that happen. I'm proud to call them my cousins. I'm proud to call them my friends. I'm proud to call them the descendants of the 110. We will never let the world forget. Thanks, Renee. Thank you, Darren. So I think the message here is that it's time to talk about slavery and open dialogue preserve the culture of the last Africans brought to America and also include uh, the history of African civilizations to understand the full story. So a rubric has been created by the National Trust on ways to go about engaging descendant communities and workshops are very important. But the other thing that is mentioned is a notion of making sure that the descendant community is a structural part of any organization making decisions about their history. Um, I know that in putting the competition together, the community insisted that I come before about 200 people, as you see in the picture here, present the entire competition idea upon which there had to be a vote. So I had to be invited by the community to come in to help with the um, design problem solving mission that we're on. And we'll talk some more about that. But I wanted to switch over to Kern uh, Jackson. Can you tell us about your oral history project in uh, Africatown and how that's tied into community engagement? Yes, yes, ma'am. Um, thank you all for having me. And I appreciate Renee and all y'all. Let me be, be a part of this. So the collection of oral history is, is, is by definition a, a, community, a community engagement device 
And um, so our project goals are to uh, sort of to participate in the process of cu cultivating, you know, our humanity, which is sort of crucial to democracy, something that we need right now. And um, sorry, my phone is losing its mind. Um, so in our collection process, um, we continue to strive to sort of be intelligent readers of folks' lives and circumstances. In other words, you know, we want to explore the need to share story. And at the University of South Alabama Oral History Project in Africatown, what we aim to uncover is uh, and collect our uh, history, oral histories from members of greater Africatown community. And that's both folks who live in there and folks who have part of the collective memory of this unique um, community on the Mobile Tensaw Delta. Um, this area is really, is particularly rich. Uh, it has multiple heritages connected to it, not only the Clotilde, but you got four central churches, you got educational centers, both formal and un informal, such as Mobile County Training School. Uh, you have, in addition, there are many untold stories about themes like uh, Dr. Robinson said about resiliency surrounding things like the Africatown graveyard, you know, the notions of the effect of post-Civil War and reconstruction, um, thriving um, 20th century uh, activity in Africatown as an enclave, um, being challenged by our urban renewal. You know, you have sub themes such as civil rights and migration and the like. But what we believe is that uh, individuals in the African diaspora with their composite heritages and their stories, like those in Africa Town, can create bridges and be go-betweens and mediators between communities and cultures. We anticipate the narratives that we collect to serve various community purposes from exhibits to construct, contributing to research and to uh, public conversation. Uh, in the process, these amazing stories will enhance regional Alabama to be sure but we hope contribute to the national discourse, um, ultimately promoting an understanding and en enhancing appreciation of, 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 of a, a place with such a vibrant culture. So this project aims to help those within Africa Town and uh, certainly into the general public to discover and share the meanings of life found through this soft science project. Specifically, this project will collect important stories through oral history of life in Africa Town share the oral histories through unique way, uh, through the unique What's Your Story exhibit, and ultimately uh, will travel throughout the county and the state. Um, we're going to use the, this project to coordinate with the future of the, the Heritage House um, and, and, and also uh, use the Omega platform at the University of South Alabama's McCall Rare Book and Manuscript Library to make the oral histories and presentation materials available. Um, we hope folks use this material to create uh, opportunities for other sort of foundation for national grants to expand projects such as this. Um, we hope that this uh, collection will also be the focus of a public event or conference. And of course, we hope that the materials collected will be beneficial to partners and be a resource for wonderful folks like those on this call who are also participating in what has definitely become, you know, excitingly synergistic efforts uh, of understanding parts of the Africa diaspora, which, you know, sometimes the written record has overlooked. So that's what the oral history is all about. Thank you. Vicki, do you want to talk about your community engagement activity in Africa and Benin? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I had a, uh, it'll, be, it'll, it'll be in my book one day uh, about how we came to, to, to go to Africa. And I, when I say we, I mean me and, and uh, Jason Lewis. But basically I knew that the competition um, should include Africatown USA State Park in Pritchard. And going through the history and reading about the, um, you know, the things that happened in the past, uh, a, a former mayor, John Smith, made it his mission to, to connect Africatown and Africatown USA and uh, also worked very closely with the community. And so I felt like that part also needed to be included in the competition. So uh, we took a trip to Benin um, to meet with the, uh, the, the, pe the, the people who are in charge of a project called the Benin House and, uh, and talked to them and asked their permission to, uh, to include um, their, some of their uh, aspects of their work in, the, um, in, our, in our planning process. So what they did was, uh, uh, it just so happened that while we were there, we also were able to talk, go directly and meet with the, um, 
basically the Society of uh, Architects and uh, Urban Planners in, um, in Benin. It just so happened that all those, those, all those fortuitous things happened. And so um, we had an opportunity to, to get their approval. But uh, and Jason going also uh, there, um, it opened his eyes to the potential and possibilities of what could be, be brought back uh, to the area. So I want to, if Jason, if you can just talk a little bit uh, about your uh, kind of what you saw when you were in Benin and, and what that's going to mean for the community and for this competition. Yeah, when you say just so happiness, I think it's crucial to point out that all the personality that ends up on this call today on the ninth presentation where we learned on that road in Wida, uh, the African male had to turn around nine times in order to make them to forget their home before they boarded it on that road to cross the Atlantic. And so the significance of this is you have people that were ages six to 19 years old that made it. So when you hear Darren Patterson talk about all of the innovation that took place and you hear Renee talk about the resiliency and the intellect of these people to create a community, they were six to 19 years old when they came here. So there are things that were taught to them in the motherland that carried with them over to the Americas that is going to take uh, a year, two years, 20 years worth of scholarship just to uncover that aspect. Uh, but to allude to our trip to Africa, Africa was an eye opener because if we don't create a place in Africa town where our children can go and touch and feel and get the aesthetics of what it's like to be back in the place where they're originally from, then hopefully we can get a bunch of passport to take them back to experience what we experienced. And what we really experienced was we saw us. And when you see those commonalities and those common threads in people that you've never met, but in some way, shape or form, they, they jump the stratosphere and make it to you on the other side of the ocean, generations apart from what your family is, then it speaks to why this work is important. And so uh, what this uh, campaign is doing uh, with you guys is gonna be major in how we glue that together and how we start piecing together some rites of passage for our youth in America that can take the six to 19 year old and begin to create building blocks to where we have the master architects or the great sports writer or the great authors like Natalie that's on the phone and make it really a common thing because while over there, me and Vicky had a chance to link up with, I was working with a young man who was in his doctoral program and he was actually going into the interior of Africa to get the story and the oral histories of what was going on on the outskirts of Wida and tying the villages back to what was happening here. So when I greet people now, I, I, I tell them, mi fon kunjia, uh, ne mi de bon which means good morning and how you're doing because the homely feel that you get in the South, you get that exact same thing over there. So when you see people talk about Southern hospitality, That's what that really is a reflection of is what we are culturally. And one of the biggest thing I wanna leave you with as a thought, when you go to the South and you shake somebody's hands and you greet them, you have one thing in common with me and going to Africa and that was this. When I went to Africa, I found out we wanna be re relevant in culture in America as African-Americans, but they wanna be relevant in our urban design and architecture and experience in America. And once we begin to do that, the core that draws us all together will link beautifully together uh, once this thing is done. Thank you, Jason. See, that's why that's you. Why Thank you. So next we're going to talk about the racialization of space. <clears throat> uh, what actually is going on in the uh, African psyche when they literally come through captivity and confinement to get to a point where they're emancipated and they can actually end up having control over their own land. Uh, the way that the report looks at this <clears throat> is we go all the way back to Africa and we begin to look at the capture, these 110 being placed in barracoons, such as the, last, the bottom picture on the uh, left-hand side, that is a barracoon. It is a Portuguese word for enclosure or barricade. So in terms of racialization of space, we basically had uh, 
Americans and Europeans taking Africans and containing them in these holding pens until they could be taken to the ship. Once they got on the ship, of course, another level of confinement, all right? And the slave ship really, we're very excited about the Clotilda having been found in 2019, the last slave ship. A lot of enthusiasm from the tourist community. But for black people, when we see that slave ship, we don't think of it as simply an artifact. We think of it as that having been the floating prison upon which our people were confined as they were dragged from their mothers and fathers across the ocean to land in America and never be seen again by their family members. So there's an emotional layer to this when Black people look at this notion of slave ship. And we really want the story of the Clotilda to be told from multiple views, not just the views of the dominant culture on this one. In terms of racialization of space, once the ship gets here, their next notion of confinement is being confined on plantations for free labor in slave housing. After emancipation, the Africans were emancipated but because they were not US citizens, they could not buy property. So the next racialization of space occurred when the Africans had to basically get naturalization papers to become US citizens before they could have the right to buy land in America after the Civil War. And then they went back to the slave owner and asked the slave owner if they would be kind enough to just give them some land because of all the free labor. And the Meyer said, after all we've done for you, we clothed you for five years while you worked for us for free. So this notion that these Africans could basically follow all the rules after emancipation, work in the sawmills owned by the slave owners for pittance a day, save enough money to collaborate, to buy parcels of land together and then to build actual houses is just simply amazing. So Africatown was literally created in 1868. Kojo Lewis is one of the co-founders. <clears throat> I just finished a grant where we looked at the um, photos and interviews of Zora Neale Hurston uh, that she made of him in 1927 and took those words and photographs and used them to regenerate the actual plans for Kudrow Lewis's house, which you see kind of microscopically here at the top. It was not an African house. It was a log cabin. He was a great builder. Most of the um, Africans who in fact were enslaved were building their own slave quarters at the plantation as well as a number of mansions. So the building skills are, are pretty remarkable. Um, the, the thing about Africatown and racialization of space, however, is these Africans had to create their own enclave after emancipation, so they would not be ridiculed by the African-American slaves, and so they could get away from the racism of the previous slave owner. So they created this enclave for their own personal psychological safety. And now in these days, at one time, they had full access to the water. You can see from the zoning map here, that central node, that yellow node is Africatown. And now Africatown has been totally ensconced by a proliferation of heavy industry. Everything in purple is literally beginning to choke out uh, this historic district. So that's another layer of the racialization uh, of space. But now what we have is this notion of celebrating the public history of the place. Uh, a million plus dollars has been raised to create this heritage house in Africatown to hold some of the Clotilda artifacts. And we're very happy about that. But we also believe that now is the time to be talking about more permanent cultural facilities that are really designed using uh, African architectural principles of cultural identity so that we can really begin to take uh, a larger responsibility for how we want our cultural institutions to look 
in accordance with uh, principles of African uh, form and building. Um, in addition to things that are architectural, we also have to talk about uh, the impact of slavery on uh, public health. And I want to introduce Deborah Plant, who wrote the essay called Could You Say I Cry? She's also the editor of the New York Times best-selling book, uh, Barracoon by Zora Neale Hurston. Deb. Uh, hi, Renee. Am, am I there? You're there. You're on. OK, can you see me? Mm -hmm. No. Can you see the screen? I can I see you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's your turn. Go. OK. Um, so so uh, thank you, um, and, and good afternoon to all the uh, participants and, and viewers. Um, Zarna Hurston is, most of us I think may know, uh, not only a genius novelist, and, and most people may be familiar with Their Eyes Were Watching God, which was her considered uh, her masterpiece, uh, at least one of her masterpieces. But she is also uh, an anthropologist cultural anthropologist. And this, this aspect of Hurston's life is less well known, um, but we come to have some, some more intimacy with this part of her through Barracoon, uh, which she, this is the story that she uh, collected from uh, Kosala, which many of us no as Cujo Lewis. She went down to the South, uh, including Alabama, to do some collecting uh, for um, Franz Boas, who she worked with a great deal. He was the preeminent uh, cultural anthropologist in America. Also uh, did some work for um, Carter G. Woodson. And so that work took her to see uh, Kosala. And in talking with him and getting his story, uh, she got the information she needed to get for uh, Dr. Woodson, but she, she knew that there was more there. And so she returned uh, the following year and, and did extensive interviews with uh, Kosala and for a cumulative period of about three months. And so out of all of this work, this going back and forth, talking with, with Kosala, she captures his story and she captures, you know, this, this really remarkable piece of history that in many ways we can consider it's one of the biggest missing pieces for African Americans in, in this country, because although we, we had in those narratives um, from enslaved Africans like Frederick Douglass, and we have some sense of what enslavement was about, but not really a sense of the whole phenomenon of being captured on the continent of that whole process of being detained in the barracoons. And of course, coming across the Middle Passage, that was not the story in most of the narratives that we had about the whole period of enslavement. So Hurston, in listening uh, to all of these various aspects of, of Kosla's life, gives us that otherwise lost history. <laughs> and so what, what we find you know, when she's talking with Kosala, we find that not only is he rich in his knowledge of uh, the motherland and rich in the, the cultural traditions that get translated into Africatown, actually, um, what we also get is the impact of the experience of being captured, 
the impact of being deracinated. You know, what did that mean? What did that do? And to be pulled up, to uproot it from everything you know, uprooted from your motherland, uprooted from your mother, your mother tongue, everything that is a core of who you are, you're torn away from that. But when, when Hurston talks with Kosala, we find that even after almost 90 years, that this is still alive in him, painfully so. So when she's talking with him quite often, he, he is reduced to tears. And he sometimes is just staring into the past in such a way as though it is still unfolding before his eyes. And when he's in those moments, then Hurston very quietly takes her leave. And it, it speaks to the pain, it speaks to the trauma. It speaks to the heartbreak and, and the heartache. And, and when he, he's telling her about the, the massacre, decapitations, he says, I, I, try, I try to not to cry about that anymore. <clears throat> he says, but the tears, are, they, they fall down inside of me all of the time. And so even as he has survived enslavement, even as he has survived Jim Crow, even as he has survived um, being ostracized by other African-Americans, even with, with all of that, he still is a man who, you know, is in touch with his emotions. He is able to speak about the, the pain, about the hurt, to share that. And this is one aspect of who we are as African-Americans uh, that we have to understand, that vulnerability. And that vulnerability is, is very important because when we look at someone like Josiah Knott. We, under, we, we began to understand this, um, this sort of, what would I call it? Situation, <laughs> if you will. The circumstance in which people of African descent found themselves in, uh, in terms of our relationships with those who, um, either colonized or captured or enslaved us wherever we are across the globe, is that we weren't seen as human beings. And that even to the extent that we could be seen by them as human beings, people like Josiah Knott had concluded that we basically didn't have the same feelings that uh, Europeans had that somehow we were less emotional, uh, less emotionally endowed, that somehow we could tolerate the extreme work, somehow we could tolerate uh, malnutrition, somehow we could tolerate being treated as something other than a human being. And so this, this mindset uh, was part of the mindset of many uh, in almost every sector of life in terms of how African people of African descent were being perceived. Whether we were being perceived as, as uh, objects, as chattel, as uh, something subhuman and therefore 
it was okay to exploit. It was okay to uh, brutalize. It was okay to sell. It was okay to cheat. Um, this was the mindset. And this mindset became part of what is called scientific racism. And this scientific racism became also part of what's called American eugenics. And this allowed those in a medical profession, those in politics, those in the social sciences and what have you to think that it was okay to basically dismiss our humanity. And in doing that, we have um, all of these various kinds of, of events, uh, ongoing events, as, as suggested here, uh, the Tuskegee experiment, for instance, where black men who had syphilis and black men who did not have syphilis were part of an experiment to see how syphilis, um, how it worked in, in the male body. They were part of an experiment that they had no, they gave no consent to. And even after these doctors, um, you know, did their work in their study and they finally uh, found a cure, not through African uh, American men, but they found a cure for syphilis. And, but instead of giving the penicillin to black men, they allowed the disease to continue to ravish their bodies and allowed it to continue to spread to the families of those men and therefore to the community of uh, the people of Tuskegee and in that area. And so when it comes to health, our human, not being treated as human beings, we, our health was not being taken care of. If anything, our bodies were being used for scientific experimentation. You know, this is the case with the Tuskegee experiment. This was the case with um, uh, Henrietta Lack. Uh, this was the case with Marion Sims, who is known as the so-called father of gynecology, who actually experimented on enslaved women without any anesthesia. And only now are they taking down his statue out of Central Park. Um, it speaks to the insensitivity with which the larger a white community uh, looks at us and treats us. Uh, when it comes to COVID, you know, we, we get all kinds of numbers about black people being uh, disproportionately targeted by COVID when really black people were more vulnerable, not necessarily because of what they kept calling um, the, being predisposed to it, having symptoms that predispose us to the ravages of COVID. That, that was just superficial because the symptoms that had us be predisposed to it came from the stressors related to racism in America. And doctors and scientists and psychologists are putting these things together today. But for the most part, uh, for, for the masses of us, this is still something you know, we still have to learn about. We still have to know about. Uh, because it's part of the violence that people of African descent experience in this, in this country. And that violence includes police brutality, of course. And why would it take anyone to know that kneeling on someone's neck for over nine minutes in the position that George Floyd was positioned in, that that could actually cost him his life. And of course it did. 
So all of these things, you know, go back to the idea that people of African descent aren't quite human, that we somehow don't have the uh, physical, emotional endowment of other people. And these are uh, ideas that still have to be discussed, talked about, dealt with, and have people understand the common humanity of us all. This Thanks. is the one. This is the one thing that uh, Kosala also helps us to see that we have to look at this wounded. And oh, a couple of things. Uh, one, there's uh, you know with with all of the the police brutality that that we are all witness to these days. There's one, uh, Dr. David Williams, I think his name was, who was telling us how every time an unarmed black man or an unarmed black woman or child is killed by police officers for upwards of three months, that whole state where that person has been killed, black people in that state experience mental strain and have to take mental health leave to deal with these, these shootings. Deborah. And, yes. We're going to have to move right along. Okay. But I want to thank you because um, the, 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 the urgency and the gravity of the things that you're bringing to our attention are going to have everything to do with how the history of Africatown literally gets interpreted back to the public. We've got to install the emotional layer. Yes. But we also have to talk about brick and mortar things. So Vicki's going to uh, take us through the Africatown neighborhood plan which um, is a plan that was recently put together by way of um, all of the CDC organizations in, in Africatown. Vicki. Sorry, I have myself on mute. Um, I'm not gonna uh, uh, belabor the point because a lot of the, the ideas are in the Africatown neighborhood plan. Mm -hmm. uh, the main thing I wanted to focus on was it, um, there, there were the, the, the story was basically we just need some kind of critical mass something that will push this thing over the edge and kind of create the momentum and i looked at that um as the uh the african town as, as the uh, the finding of the cotillo that that is the thing that has set everything in motion which is why we get uh, people get phone calls we've got uh, people coming and studying uh, uh this and that to set up tourism all those things now can can uh, fuel the plan so, so now it's up to the community to decide what are, what are the most important things out of that neighborhood plan that they want to see. Um, there, there's always been talk about redevelopment of housing. There's always been talk about uh, using uh, the history of Africatown as an as a economic tool, and we'll get to that later. But the main thing is to kind of is use um, this, this, this uh, history and to use all that to kind of enliven that neighborhood plan. Uh, but in particular, we have to, uh, to deal with uh, some zoning issues. I don't know if Rams is, is back on the call because he's Mr. Zoning, and I don't know if he wants to talk to, if he's there to talk about this. But uh, right now, the city is uh, updating its uh, zoning plan, the uh, unified uh, uh, code, and there are some things in there that would really uh, that really won't help after town that much. So it's really up to the the community to really uh, Im impress upon the, the the political leadership and the zoning and planning officials. That uh, the plan that what comes out of the competition, the ideas that come out of the competition, the things that, that are coming out of the plan, will be supported um, uh, uh, through the through the planning processes, and that the zoning will allow for the kinds of uh, developments that we hope will come out of the competition, like mixed use development. Um, there's a, a, a memorials projects that uh, Jason's group is talking about. Or there are projects with the school, and of course the welcome center, and those things are already in in, in play. But as we think about the future of Africa Town, we really have to look at what is it going to take to move that plan forward and, and how the, the community can, can use it in a way, uh, use that plan in conjunction with the ideas that we hope will come from the, um, from the designers and the, the design competition 
to really take these ideas from a two design, a two um, two dimensional idea, and something that can be developed into a three uh, dimensional idea. Okay, let's go. Mm-hmm. Oops, going the wrong way. Vicky, you want to talk about cultural tourism and how that's tied to Africa Town and the founding of the Clotel? Oh, absolutely. Um, we, when uh, Jason and I were talking earlier about uh, Benin, uh, the, the, the early founders of, uh, well, not listen to them as the founders, but the um, political leaders of Africa Town always understood the, the economic power of um, their, their story. And so in, the, uh, in that essay, uh, especially Nate, who's, uh, I think he's on the call, uh, Nate and found some, some uh, um, information about the power of, of uh, economics in that area. And, and, I mean, the power of economics when it comes to cultural tourism. And basically, uh, what's happening is the people uh, right in Alabama right now are seeing the power of the black, of black culture. The, um, the Africa Town, the, the, um, the mall, the, the African American Museum on the mall, the legacy of the, of the Lynch Museum in Montgomery, which has been, which has become the, the the top tourism asset for the state of Alabama in 2019. The power of the story is that we have billions of dollars that travelers um, look, who are looking for cultural experiences want to will pay money for, and to create those kinds of assets in Birmingham in uh, Mobile are, are going to be essential for Africa Town, especially when they're being built in Africa Town. Right now, we know that the, the uh, Heritage House is a, is a great asset, but it's only 5,000 feet. It's going to be too small. Uh, the the David Clark with the uh, Visit Mobile has already estimated that we could probably get as many as a million people in here. So it's gonna be very important that we have the kinds of uh, spaces where that, 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 that many people can come. And so what that would also do is pre uh, create the opportunity for jobs. So uh, in Nate's report, he talks about the kinds of jobs that will be created, um, that could be created through the conventions, through meetings, through, cura through uh, curation of museums. And so for instance, uh, the median pay for convention planners is a uh, is uh, fifty thousand dollars a year, uh, bachelor's degree that and the, and the opportunity and the outlook for that is, is faster than average. We're looking at potential curators, uh, at archivists, and museum workers. The average median pay in twenty nineteen is forty nine thousand uh, dollars. We're looking at recreation workers for twenty six thousand dollars a year. But we're also looking at the possibility of having so many people come in, entrepreneurs setting up businesses in these er in uh, in Africa Town and along the area around Africa Town. So that will create more jobs for the community, especially when we get more job training, we get more workforce development issues around uh, construction, housing construction, those type of things that we know are gonna, uh, that the community wants and that needs to happen as a result of this boom. And so the, our, we look at the uh, tourism piece as an opportunity for the community to really have some sustainability, to really create jobs that will allow people to remain in the area because there, there may be some level of gentrification that happens in Africa town because it needs so much so it needs so much right now but all that will do is kind of lift the, the rising tide can lift the boats as long as the boats don't have holes in them and so it's going to be important that we bring in the kinds of support systems that allow us to capture not only capture the, the tax dollars capture the jobs but also recirculate that money to, to uh, sustain what's happening in the area uh, I was looking for a quote from um, one of the founders of Africa Town. And basically in the story that was written 40 years ago, um, it, uh, and it's in the uh, report, it talks um, about an article that was, uh, an editorial article that was written in the, the press register about the opportunity for Africa Town to be uh, a civic, uh, cultural and economic engine for the area. And so uh, as you go back and read the, the report, we, I really encourage you to go back and look at that, but to, just, just to realize that the people of Africa Town have been thinking about this and praying about this and working about this for a very long time. So our hope is now is that with the, uh, the, all the interest in the Clotilde and, and, and the billions of dollars that could potentially generate, not just for Africa Town, but for the whole area, that we be very careful to ensure that the community economically benefits from this so that the vision of the mayor of Pritchard or John Smith, whom I referred to earlier, um, and also Henry C. Williams, who are known, who's known as the father of Africa Town, they, they looked at, um, they talked about it being a, a total historic spot that can include businesses, a library, museum, a park, bank, and perhaps a little safari or nature park. And John Smith saw it, and he saw, and this is, this is again, years ago, 1981, he saw this as the largest black historic preservation district in the United States 
with the potential to have a sizable impact on the local economy. That's even more true now than it was then. And we're looking for um, the ideas that come out of this competition and what happens afterwards to start seeding and to putting into practice the things that those uh, very visionary gentlemen talked about. Um, Thank back you, in Vicky. 19 I think what we really need here is that we're going to need an economic development plan in order to put that into motion. Exactly. Thank and, you. And it, for and it needs to be regional. It's not just one city or two cities. It's going to cross three cities and three several jurisdictions and go all the way back to Africa. So it's going to be very important that we look at this as a regional project and not just as one city or one local project. Thank you. Thank you. Joe Womack, are you there? Ramsey, are yes, you there, yes. Joe? Yes, yes, ma'am. I'm eyes here. Okay. <laughs> well, Joe Womack is with us, uh, who is definitely a street fighter when it comes to uh, environmental issues in Africa Town. He is the executive director of Africa Town Chess CDC. Joe, tell us what the purpose of chess is and what you've been doing in terms of industrial pollution. Okay. Let me just uh, take my five minutes here. And, and, and say this, um, uh, as most people know, they, they know where the first shipment of slaves came in in, in, in 1619 Jamestown, but not a lot of people know where the last shipment came in. There's a, only one place right here, Africa Town, North Mobile, Alabama. And, and uh, uh, what we want a lot of people to know is that some of the same problems that they experienced years ago when they got here, we experience the same problems today. It's the same people. You know, 160 years, and not not much has changed. Uh, we but we we'll, we we'll, we're we'll, we'll making changes though. We want Africa Town to be known as America's Town because the the professionals that are put on this uh, display here today, they've been tasked with uh, designing all of Africa Town, not just the historic district. Af all of Africa Town is five square miles. The historic district just two square miles. They have been tasked with designing all of Africa Town for survival and sustainability, and that's the key thing. Africa Town been here for 160 years. We wanted to stay here forever and 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 to improve and sustain itself. So when you, when I, when I look at it, that last shipment came over here in 1860. Very resourceful people. I call them babies pretty much, and and they were very uh butt naked. A lot of people said. My people came over here with nothing but the clothes on their backs. Well, our people didn't have nothing on their backs. But 10 years after they got here, they had acquired enough. Uh, they didn't speak English, but they, 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 they went downtown and filed the correct paperwork to incorporate their own mm -hmm. area called Africa Town. You know, it just, it just <laughs> 10 years. And, and, and the first 50 years I refer to as the years of the slaves. I say slaves because I want you to know who, who was running the thing. The people that came off the off the cliff of the other, they had their own, they had the chief, they had the medicine man, and then and then and, and, and they they took care of the people. They ran the thing for about 50 years. And then about 1910, when the school became big enough and was certified by the state, and you had a man to move here, came in from Monroe named uh, Nelson Adam and his buddy John Kidd. They they saw a, a business opportunity. John Kidd saved one of the male uh, boys from drowning and and so they gave him some land and they began to purchase land. And pretty soon, he, uh, 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 Nelson Adams had much as much land within Africa Town as the male family did. And so they built houses and they leased houses to individuals and, and they didn't kick nobody out the house because they couldn't pay the, uh, pay the uh, rent. They just gave them time and that time then, you know, things rolled over and they gave them a job and let them pull nails and build houses and they, they, they paid off the, what was due. So, so the first 50 years was Africa Town, the Africans, the slaves, former slaves was in charge. The next 50 years, uh, pretty much uh, Nelson Adams, uh, John Kidd, uh, uh, Elliot Hubbard, uh, uh, Mr. Randolph, the business owners. Uh, uh, we had our own pope, first black postmaster in, in, in Mobile County, right there in Africa Town, uh, uh, by the name of May. And we had our own post office. And the Baybridge Road was, was a downtown, was downtown Africa town. And so, so Joe, just, tell us about the industries that came in and the I'm pollution. <laughs> you can't talk about Africa town without talking about the industry. So from 1860 to 1960, that's 100 years. So, so they wanted to move up to, to the 20, 20th century because you had factories here polluting the ground. You had outhouses here going in the ground. You had people here pulling water out of the ground, drinking it. 
And so Mobile said, look, we come part of Mobile and we'll give you, we'll pave your streets and we'll give you water and sewer. And so the residents voted to become part of Mobile, but that was, that was, that was almost a death sentence because what happened was they depended on Mobile to take care of them until instead of taking care of themselves. So at that time in 1960, the, the community had 12 neighborhoods and the city began to come in and, and build highways and byways and, and pretty soon it's down to, to, uh, to, to six neighborhoods and industry was moved in there and they started rezoning stuff from, from residential to, uh, to businesses, commercial and businesses. And now we're surrounded by 15 to 20 uh, uh, hazardous producing industries around in our area. And that's what happened to us. So, so now th that was the design that the city of Mobile had for Africatown, basically to design you out of existence. So now we're trying to design ourselves back into existence, even around the industry to get back to the water and to even expand. At one time we was up to 10,000 people. Now we're down, down to 2,000 and we want to get back up, renovate the community and, 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 and uh, bring people back into the community because it's, it's like a nice little retirement area now. And so the, the land is there and we want to bring the people back. And that's what we're asking Renee and, and her professional architects to, to do the re redesign the community uh, for sustainability and, uh, and for su survival. And, and instead of your sons and daughters going to Las Vegas for a wedding, we want them to come to Africa town where they can jump the broom. <laughs> and, and, and we, 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 we want the ultimate goal is to make Africa town a African American cultural heritage destination, a place where you can come and learn about African culture, Af African history, the history of the uh, Clotilde and other things related to African American history right here in Mobile. And, uh, and they, they've got a good, good start of getting, getting this thing done. Thank you, Joe. So we're going to have to clean up Africa town because the whole world is watching. And we have two great community organizations that have their eyes keenly on pollution infringements. So now I'm going to switch to you seeing all of the emotion, all of the history, all of the reporting uh, that has gone on uh, led by the community. We were brought in to basically develop an, the Africa town international design idea competition um to basically raise the standards for design excellence and rather than talking about just the regeneration of the historic district of africa town what we have done is we have found a way to basically tell the stories at four sites and 16 venues that together make up what we call the africa town cultural uh, mile we have a host of sponsors the competition is going to be launched june 10th 2021 go to www.africatowndesign.com. But the way that this works is this. We've invented a competition. We've invented a cultural mile that basically connects all the dots. We've just finished um, generating blueprints for the Kojo Lewis House, which we hope will be turned into a small house museum, the contents of which will talk not about the Clotilda, but about literally the making of Africatown the architecture of Africa Town, how Kudju built his house, the tools needed to actually drive the nails and mix the mortar, all of that will be part of that discussion. And then our big deal today is uh, the preview to the American uh, Roundtable case study. So the Africa Town design competition listened to everything that everyone who's already spoken has had to say over the last three years. We've listened to the challenges about infrastructure. We've listened to the challenges uh, about public health, about education, about facilities, about architecture, about buildings. And we organize all of these conversations into four basic sites for this design competition. And so what will happen is you can select either doing designs for historic Africa town, site number one, where you have to design a welcome center expand the existing school, which used to be on a Rosenwald site, and also come up with 30 facades for infill housing and a gateway. If you choose a second site, that's an abandoned public housing site. You're gonna to have to put in maritime residential housing, a boathouse for the Clotilda, a museum, and a gateway to ancestors. 
If you choose the third site, we call that <clears throat> the Blue Wave site. You'll have to basically design an Africa Town Yacht Club, quote unquote, uh, and also uh, a series of water taxis branded to look like the boats of Benin. And you'll also have to design 15 pavilions for walk along walking trails and tell the story. If you select the fourth site, which is the Africa Town Park USA, 160 acres of land, you'll have to do a genealogy center, an African art museum and performing arts center, uh, as well as a hotel trade center and, and gateway. So what we're trying to do here is to take all of the stories and information and establish a very strong design theme that has one multivocal narrative that connects all of the interpretive sites around the Africa town story. And that's how we get the, uh, the, the cultural mile. It's time to basically connect the dots architecturally because the story is bigger than just the historic district. Um, the Africa Town Cultural Mile is literally a series of monuments, memorials, and interpretive sites that will develop into a single uh, cultural tourism theme that serves as an economic development engine, not just for the district, but for the entire region, because the Africa Town story literally uh, proliferates uh, throughout the region. So what we wanted to do is, um, as we're summing up, is also give you just a taste of a film uh, that uh, we are doing with uh, Theo Moore and Historical Productions. Uh, he is also going through quite the interview process, but he's producing a documentary film. This is just a trailer coming up called African by Way of American, because it's also time to engage our most creative minds in the storytelling of Africa Town. And let's see if this will come up. This is the trailer for the documentary film that we're working on. And the sound will come up in one moment. So slavery is a very old institution in the history of the world. And I think it's important to distinguish between how slavery existed in antiquity versus how Europeans implemented slavery in the New World. Africa Town was established in 1870 by 32 West Africans from the coastal area that is currently known as Benin. The 32 West Africans did not come to America willingly. Unfortunately, they were part of the 110 African captives smuggled aboard the last known leader shipment of Africans. In the community, both in terms of helping to get it accredited, helping to get it financial support, and also the churches were the only large, large venue that individuals could gather and have graduation, baccalaureate, and other kinds of chorus and choir uh, gatherings in the process.
I'll write a design competition program for the design of the new Africatown Museum, and we'll call it a design idea competition. The competition grew from being the design of just a single museum to the identification of four sites and 16 venues that when they all come together will now create the Africatown Cultural Mile. So that's just a smattering of all of the subject matters and topical areas and emotional charges that you're going to see running through our Africatown um, case study. We invite you to read the full report. It's about 193 pages. You can pull up the full report through the Architectural League's website, Project Africatown, uh, Alabama. I wanna thank uh, everyone who wrote essays and who participated um, today. It's time to basically structurally engage the entire community in the telling of these stories and in the making of the places in order to regenerate Africatown for the benefit of the community, the city, and the world. The finding of the Clotildas should be used to basically leverage the regeneration of much blighted Africatown. What we say is, if you can save the ship, you can save the town. I'm gonna turn it back over to Rosalie and also uh, Nick. Africatown, thanks you for this opportunity today. Thank you and thank you to everyone who um, just presented and shared so many of the amazing stories um, about Africatown and its history and the current opportunities um, that it now has with the discovery of the Clotilda and all of the um, planning initiatives to reclaim its story and to hopefully um, restore and build a better future for this amazing and a word that's usually not used correctly, but unique community um, that, it, that it truly is. Um, we do have a couple minutes um, for uh, Q&A. If there is anyone in the audience who would like to ask any questions, um, please add it to the Q&A feature. Um, just to start, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about the lay of the land right now in terms of engagement with the city and the state and sort of the development activities around um, the Welcome Center and the Heritage House and what organizations the community that are existing in the community to ensure that its voice is being heard and that um, all of this current development and it, it will um, be done in a kind of correct and proper way that benefits the community. Okay. Well, well, thank you, Nick. For um, traditionally, Africatown community has been divided into maybe about four or five community development corporations that each had separate and sometimes uh, conflicting uh, agendas. But really, once the Africatown neighborhood plan was put together, it really brought everyone together in the community to focus on central goals of what needed to be done. In addition to that, another organization has grown out of this, um, uh, this, this need for communication and consolidation. And that is the newly formed Africatown Heritage Preservation uh, Foundation, which is to be the umbrella over all things Africatown going forward. Uh, the Heritage House is very, very interesting. Um, it came because of political champion um, 
Merceria Ledgood, who is county commissioner. She got county funds uh, that were matched by uh, Councilman Manzi. And then they went back and got some additional funding in order to basically build the Heritage House, 5,000 square feet of space, which was politically very important to the people of Africatown. When the Clotilda was found, uh, the Africatown community insisted that artifacts from that find be brought right on back uptown uh, to Africatown, but there was no place to put the artifacts. So the uh, Heritage House was built in order to basically contain the artifacts. And the Heritage House, the groundbreaking just happened. It is seen as a temporary uh, placement uh, for those artifacts until uh, the city literally decides on the next step, which is going to be a, a welcome house in Africatown. They just posted an RFQ. Uh, the city has not yet announced the winners, uh, but we know that the African uh, Welcome Center is coming online. The beauty of the Welcome Center in terms of siting is that it's exactly at the edge of the African burial ground of the historic African cemetery uh, there, the whole Plateau Historic Cemetery. And so to see what kind of conversations thematically will go on between the Welcome House and the cemetery is gonna be pretty interesting. Uh, most of the Clotilda uh, shipmates are literally buried in, uh, in that uh, cemetery. Uh, there've been a number of archeological uh, reports done on the area. But, but in terms of who's involved, it is literally a cast of thousands. Uh, and so a lot of coordination is really going to be needed. But of course we have, you know, the city of Mobile, they now have an innovation team uh, that they're working with. We have the community, we've got the Mobile County Commission, we've got the Alabama Historical Commission, we have the Smithsonian, we have the Slave Rex Project, we have the UNESCO Sites of Memory, there's a lot going on, a lot of interest going on in Africa town right now. I think that our primary hope is that it all gets coordinated around an economic development plan that is definitively tied to a tourism plan that brings revenue to Africa town because after all, it is their story. So we're looking towards a comprehensive architectural theme that's tied to an agreed upon narrative, who is going to tell the story? We're thinking that rather than the story being told by dominant culture, as is usually the case in terms of a lot of museum work, what we're looking forward to is this notion of multi-vocality so that the voices that you heard just now can also become part of the narrative. I also, I want to add one more thing to that as well. There's also been the creation of the Africatown Redevelopment Corporation that was uh, spearheaded through the, the uh, local um, legislative, legislative bodies in Africatown. And, uh, and it was created intentionally to uh, create, put more control in the hands of the community. Uh, even though in the report we talked about only two uh, people will be directly chosen by the Preservation Foundation and the Clotilda Descendants Association, the, um, the writers of that bill and that has now become law in the state of Alabama has assured the community, assured me, because I mean, I'm still a reporter, I still want to kind of know how things are going to work, but that is really designed to help the community. So that entity will be charged with, um, you know, bang, basically buying, selling property, it will be able to raise funds, it will be able to uh, 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 put out contracts for bids, it will be able to be the kind of workhorse in the community. That, um, that will be able to, to help bring some financial um, recourse into the community. So that, that's, that has been created and that's, that's also mentioned in the report. Um, but like Renee has said, um, you know, it still has to be boots on the ground in terms of the community itself taking charge and taking hold of what's happening because um, people can come in and have very good intentions, but it has to be, has to be community driven and community dominated. We're just here as, as resources. And this call and whatever and all the work that we've done has been a resource to the community because at the end of the day we're going to hand this material over to them and ask them say we, we just want to cast a vision so that people can see because without a vision the people perish so by being able to show people what it can look like it will inspire them and hopefully we'll have a chance to speak to the, all of these different groups and show present this information to them uh, the corporation has just gotten started so we may not be able to get to them before the competition launches but we will surely be uh, uh, very intent on engaging 
all of the stakeholders and being more than happy to bring all the resources, especially this, this killer girl, Renee Kemp Rotan, and the beauty of her designs and the beauty of her thinking, we'll be able to bring all of that to bear in this area. And I, and I know that 20 years from now, we're all gonna be very, very, very proud of what this community is gonna look like, what it's gonna feel like. And it's gonna be a safe place for, for black lives, for black spaces, black votes. And it's gonna be an inviting place for people who wanna come and share in that, in that, that history, that culture and respect it. Like Deborah Plant said, this is an area where um, people can feel that they're wanted, that they can feel accepted and, and know it's theirs. You know, that's the main thing, it's theirs. And we wanna make sure it stays that way and that the community always, always is, is, is at, the front, at the forefront of everything that we do. And let me also just add, you know, the competition is getting ready to go to 140 schools of architecture in this country. Yes. And to architecture schools worldwide. Mm -hmm. And it's open to architects, planners, designers. We're telling people to put together interdisciplinary teams. So all of the challenges that you've just heard today uh, online that have been made, all of these challenges are inserted into the design competition. These are problems, in fact, that the architectural community and planning community worldwide are called upon to generate ideas mm -hmm. in order to basically make a world-class destination of this place for the benefit of the community in mm -hmm. order that it might regenerate itself mm -hmm. from the content of its own story. Yes. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to... Uh, Put it all in writing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Ooh, lots of writing. Yes, lots of writing. <laughs> right. I, yeah. I see Bill Bates has just come on. He was the past <laughs> president of AIA, and I invited him down to Africa Town. So we've yeah. had the president of AIA down there, and we also went and grabbed uh, uh, Michael Blakey, the preeminent forensic archaeologist. We dragged him down from William and Mary to come and uh, see Africa Town. He's the world authority on African burial grounds. He'd never heard of it. Mm -hmm. And Michael got down on his knees and cried in that cemetery, as did I. Mm -hmm. Because it's one thing to hear the slave story, but when you go to the cemetery and you see tombstones where names are in Yoruba and Thon, as well as the English names, we don't get an opportunity to make that kind of connection. This is the only settlement in America that was built by Africans in the 19th century. So we have got to make sure that it gets preserved and we've got to make sure that as it goes through rehabilitation, that it really does become a focus point for uh, and a precedent for um, architecture, uh, planning, sustainable uh, community so that the community can thrive once again. Uh, and one more thing, there was a comment that was made in the chat about Pritchard because Pr uh, Africa Town USA is, is in Pritchard. We're very much engaged uh, with them. As a matter of fact, the mayor of Pritchard was the first elected official who officially endorsed this competition. So we will always be very grateful to Mayor Jimmy Gardner and uh, and, and also um, the, the sharing of information about the people that we met in Benin. So uh, the opportunity to make this an international competition and again, meeting with the architects there and to and we met with business people there too who want to come you know come back they came here many years ago and jason and i were at the house of one gentleman um who uh, who had remember, talked about bringing delegations of 40 people here and uh, and also they were the ones in, in some of the pictures that you'll see the de the, uh, the the delegation from budal gie they came and brought some um information to share and they're they're, they're ready to come back so yes the, the city of preacher is very much involved in this and so is the city of chickasaw uh, at the William Bradford Park. So we want to make this, that's why I said earlier, this, this is a regional project. And, yeah, and Joe yeah. mentioned that, you know, yeah, this is the, the, the historic district in the in the um, the further area of all the neighborhoods of Africa Town, but it really does extend up into um, to Pritchard. Uh, and again, I mentioned earlier also the vision of John Smith, and we we want to honor all of the, our ancestors. They didn't live to see any of the stuff that we're talking about. They, they We ride, we literally ride their backs and we, we, we're riding the coattails of their vision all we're trying to do now is to, is to put some four legs up under it and to give us some substance so that the people can move forward with it. And, and, and you know, it's also very interesting while we've been engaged in this project, um, it's also good to note that the National Organization of Minority Architects has 
they did a whole magazine on Afrofuturism mm -hmm. and what the future of Black communities should look yeah. like. Mm -hmm. And then we had the Black Panther movie and the notion of Wakanda, the notion of utopia and what Black community should look like. And then we had the Smithsonian, the new Black Museum on the Mall. They dedicated three days in 2018 to basically talking about architects, activism, and Black communities, going all the way back to the Whitney Young Challenge, you know, uh, back there in 1968, to challenge the architectural community to take on these issues of community development. We have the tools and the community have the stories. They're the authenticity that allows us to try to figure out which tool to basically use to help in a problem solving event. And so we see the competition as this tool of engagement. We see it as a tool of education, as a tool to raise public awareness about the role that architecture can play when the community basically gets to program what they want their community to look like and how they want their community to function, not just on a physical level, but on an emotional level as well because I got very choked up in hearing Dr. Plant talk about Kudjo Say I Cry, and I began to wonder, and I heard pain running through almost all of the speakers today. This is very heartfelt for us, those of the descendant community, whether it's this community or another community as African-Americans, we are all part of the diaspora. So this becomes very emotional for us. And as Deb Plant was talking, I said, oh my God, one of the things we've got to do is we've got to start designing public places that are places for reconciliation, that are places for public healing. Those things have got to happen because anytime you begin to talk about American slavery, it's more than just about, you know, the history and the boat came over. And that's why I really wanted Deborah Plant to speak today because she's the only person that I know that because she was interpreting or interpolating Zora Neale Hurston's interviews, she's able to really tap into the emotion that Kudjo was feeling. He remembered being kidnapped as a child. He remembered being dragged down to the coast of Ouida, being contained in Barracoon. I mean, you know, these things are part of what Black people call their blood memory. You know, this is blood memory for us. So now the question is whether or not uh, scholars, historians, archeologists, architects, community planners, descendants, people in the tourism industry can all come together and really agree on who is going to tell this story. Huh? Who gets to tell this story? And so that's why this note of community engagement tied to civic architecture and African principles of aesthetic and communal living become very important to attempting to get this, you know, right. I'm, um, we're, we've gone a little bit past our time, but I'm gonna, um, so I wanna say some summing up things, but I'd also like to invite anybody who's interested, and I hope all the panelists who are interested to stay on after I, you know, after I sum up a, a couple of things um, until two, because there's so many more things um, that, that we can talk about. This was a remarkable presentation and the project and is a remark for the competition is a remarkable project and it's um i mean just i want to say for me personally it's been I, I am so grateful for all that i've been able to learn through all of your work and and all that you've made available to the league's audience through your work um, so thank you particularly to Renee and Vicki, but to all of you um, as contributors to the report. Um, today is, um, and this program is the last in the series of specific place-based reports in the American Roundtable series. Um, 
the individual and collective power of these reports, I think, is, is enormous. The perspectives and the knowledge and the wisdom and the aspirations that all of the editors and the contributors to these nine reports have shared is just a huge and generous contribution to the capacity of all of us to better understand the range of experiences and the concerns that shape the American landscape. Um, I want to and I want to take a minute to thank the great team at the league that has shepherded these reports and programs into being. First of all, Nick, whose thoughtfulness and whose wide-ranging intellectual curiosity has just benefit, benefited this project without end. Um, Sarah Westler, our digital editor, and Carlisle, our communications manager, Nana Seishirakawa, our program associate and Nathan Rebor, Caitlin Kim, and Isabel Ling, who contributed their skills at critical moments to get everything done. I also want to thank Athletics, who's the digital, the digital design firm that designed the league's website, but then designed the special area for the American Roundtable project on a, um, and contributed to that design, which has made a, a, was an enormous contribution to us. Um, I want to thank Mario Gooden, Paul Lewis, and Lynn Rice of the League's board who served at the, as the advisory committee for this project. And I also want to thank National Endowment for the Arts and the Graham Foundation um, and acknowledge the J. Clausen Mills Fund of the Architectural League that have all provided the financial support for this project. Though this is um, the last specifically place-based program for the moment, it's not at all the final chapter of the American Roundtable project. Over the next month, we'll be announcing some additional programs and efforts to help us all digest all that we've learned and, and what that all of the reports together suggest for the future of the communities that have been the subjects of these reports and for other places across the country that share their challenges and possibilities. Um, I thank you all for being here today. I think there are a couple of um, editors from other reports. I saw Annie Coombs and, and Rob Hutchinson, I know who were here. Um, and I thank you all for your interest in this project and which is going to keep going. And we look forward to seeing you all again soon. And with that, we have maybe if for all those who want to stay on call, I know I have some more questions and um, we'd love to keep talking with anybody who's, um, who is able and interested to stay on. So let's take two, two seconds for people to sign up if they need to, and then, um, and then we'll keep talking. Somebody has a hand raised. Sorry? I said someone has a hand raised. Kamal had a question in the uh, Q and A. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay, there it is. Oh, yeah, great question. Um, how will the challenge of land ownership impact the competition? Do most of the current residents own the land under their homes? And um, I understand that the Meir family still owned land in Africa Town. Will that have an impact on the design competition? Well. <laughs> Interestingly enough, it's a design idea competition. So uh, in many ways, we literally can jump over some of those hoops. However, that being said, we went on fact-finding missions first so that the competition wasn't basically, I mean, it's all quite cited. And so we are not held by political constraints because it's a conceptual, you know, it's a conceptual deal. So the mayor, we are well aware that the mayors own the land, in fact, around the entire area. Uh, if you look at some of the new zoning codes, it, it, they're talking about public parks and greenery being more around the edge to replace what the industry has done. So that's going to be an interesting dance of choreography, to be quite frank. Not to generate the ideas, but when you switch from the ideology to trying to get things implemented, and we're hoping that the competition ideas, in fact, will be so wonderfully great that the entire community can begin to move some mountains here and there for actual implementation. And hopefully that new organization, the Africatown Redevelopment Corporation, might have some, some role to play in that as well in terms of land acquisition for the community. Mm -hmm. I have a question that maybe um, maybe Joe and Ramsey would be the first to weigh in on, but it's around um, questions of health and environmental 
um, justice and, and um, agency. Um, Africatown has been a place where there have been huge impacts from um, environmental injustice, where industry has, um, has had a, a very negative effect on, on the health of the community and the, the, um, you know, the condition of the land. And I know that you have a cur current controversy or a current fight going on at the um, unified develop, the new unified development code in Mobile and whether it provides adequate protections for Africa town. Um, and we, I know too that we have a new national president um, who has said that he's going to make environmental justice an important goal of his administration. So I guess I have both a, a specific and a general question um, to you. What do you hope can happen? What do you want to have happen to, in terms of redressing the environmental harms that have been perpetrated in Africa Town and and the environmental uh, threats that still exist today and what protections would you like to see in place for the future so that those kinds of things, you know, we know and we've seen actually in, in a number of the other American Roundtable reports that there is often this um, tension between the promotion of jobs and the and environmental impacts and all too often, you know, the, the economy or economic arguments went out. But what, what's your vision for how um, current environmental conditions can be addressed and, and the future um, and protections can be put in place for the future for Africa Town from that specific point of view? That's, that's a great question. Uh, I would start off just by saying, uh, responding to the, the, the dichotomy uh, of jobs versus the environment or health versus uh, jobs. Uh, there is no separation and often than not, uh, the industry and those that would line up behind them to insist that jobs are important, never address the quality of those jobs, don't address the safety of those that work those jobs, don't address the health impacts of those people who work those jobs. Uh, and when you're dealing with large, uh, multifaceted sources of pollution, like are apparent in the Africatown community, uh, you have to deal with the fact that you're, you're looking at uh, you know, hundreds of tons of criterion pollutants that are being released into the neighborhood uh, every year. Uh, and that the, the existing regulatory frameworks should provide for oversight. And they, in Alabama, at least in this part of Alabama, they simply don't. Uh, you know, the ongoing controversies are the facts that every single air permit that we look at in the community is full of holes. They are practically unenforceable and it is demanding uh, some type of federal intervention at this point. So your astute observation that the sea change at the federal level might offer some new opportunities uh, to our efforts to clean up the community because we want to invite company, because we, the Africatown community wants uh, tourism, wants people to enjoy its history with them, uh, the, that this is a these elements of what are lacking today are key to unpacking uh, the future, this future that we want. The past, uh, as we know, is uh, insider politics and the, the slaver family descendants do own a significant portion of the properties that are leased today to uh, permitted polluters. And that uh, cleavage of the historical injustice must be addressed by city leadership if they want to see progress on this front. It is the elephant in the room here. One, one thing that uh, we've been able to do with the community and, and, and the, the significant of it is, is to show not only the local leader, but also the world that we are a marketable community. We can be marketed financially. And one thing that the city has, has voted over the years is that they really want to get involved with tourism. We're right there by the water, and uh, Africa Town is, is, of course, by the water also. We're one of the few communities within Mobile, the way they're situated, uh, that's right there by the water. And, and so with the fact that Montgomery has, has proven that uh, 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 Black tourism is a money-making uh, business, 
you know, after 12 months, the city realized an increase of over a billion dollars in their sales revenue. And then and, and we've been told by the experts in the tourism industry that uh, both locally and nationally, that we we've been mobile, we got a we got a better, we got a better product. We 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 we've got the descendants of the last slaves, we got the community they built, the church, the cemetery they buried, and now we found the boat. So if we if we do it right, uh, and build it right, and everybody it's supported by everybody. The, when I say everybody, the, the entire city and county and everybody put the whole face into it, uh, we we can be successful. And and that's the next one thing that we're really aiming to do, to show that we can do this thing right and be very successful. And we're glad that we've got professionals throughout the world, throughout the world involved in this. And, uh, and uh, um, you know, we're looking for the, you know, the, the near future and we're starting off with the Heritage House coming soon in a, in a few months. <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna do this like, like Disney World. Uh, we're gonna roll it out. Disney World in Orlando had Disney World. Then it came back with the with the with the uh, uh, Star Wars exhibit with the uh, Epcot. They kept saying, "Come on back, come on back, come on back." And so we're gonna roll. Everybody know that the Africa Town Commuter has to be renovated. And so we're starting out with the Heritage House. Then we're gonna have a Welcome Center in a couple of years. We're renovating houses uh, uh, almost as if we speak. And and uh, and so we're gonna roll this thing out and and and, and bring you all back periodically over the next few years and, and have you all children grow up with Africa Town and eventually come back here and get married in Africa Town. <laughs> just just to zero in on that point about the current zoning code fight, you know the the massive disappointment of many community members in learning that it doesn't actually provide that the zoning code changes uh, in the code that's being proposed don't address the community's demand for deindustrialization, for down zoning of open spaces that are currently industrial but are uninhabited, and also don't address the fact that you have uh, industrial activity on residentially zoned properties. These, these uh, you know, intergenerational abuses of the community uh, just are nowhere to be found in the substance of the text or, or the intent of the city leadership, to be frank. We've been very upfront with them about uh, the imperative to wrestle with these incongruities, uh, these non-compliance issues from the business community end of things, because they are very forceful about how the residents need to be uh, keeping their yards up. They're going to get slapped with the fine. We've had people who've lost houses due to tax liens. We've never seen any of these businesses that are in non-compliance with the zoning code face any, any consequences. Well done. I'm curious, actually, if you could, in speaking about the tourism and, and the future, how, if you could just speak a little bit more about how the community is envisioning that um, to also, to not only bring in the economic development, but also to sort of to maintain the, as you've said, the sort of sacredness of these sites. And I know, for example, the community was, you know, very much against, you know, the idea of, you know, a, a dinner cruise leaving from downtown will be able to come and look at the site, you know, in, in ways that really become quite crass and, and, you know, not respectful to this amazing story and this amazing community. So could you share a little bit more about how the community is envisioning that and, and hoping to put in, like, a safeguards um, to make sure that this is, you know, done with respect and, and true um, honor? Wow, therein lies the rub, because the answer to your question is, there really needs to be a tourism plan that is instituted, that is community-wide and Africatown narrative-wide. What's really happening is that individual moves are being made by groups of people <clears throat> that are looking at site-specific solutions. So the question isn't how do we tie all this stuff together it really is, we found the boat, let's start building something around the boat discovery site. That is a project. Then three miles up in Africa town, let's build a heritage house to put the artifacts in. That is a single project. And so really you see, those of us who are working on the competition, we see the total lay of the land. 
we know that there are literally 16 sites that tell the story, but there is no central plan. And so the competition was invented to basically create that dialogue so that people can begin to talk about putting things together. What we really need is we needed a national round table on the regeneration of Africatown because we also have you know, quite a few stakeholders here and those stakeholders are kind of broken off into cliques of their own particular disciplines, do you know? And then we have the issue of engagement. You know, we have to get that straight. Some of the stakeholders' notion of engaging the community is calling up somebody on the phone and saying, what do you think about X, Y, Z? That's not the same as having the descendants of the enslaved and the descendants of the enslavers, the historians, the traffic engineers, the planners, you know, everybody all at one table to basically make something of this thing, you know, uh, where the whole becomes greater than the sum of its individualized parts. We need, we need two things, an economic development plan, yeah. and we need a cultural heritage tourism plan that ties all of these pieces together by design mm -hmm. rather well, than uh, individual action. Well, what you, what you have right now, if, if I can uh, paint, paint a picture for you, if, if you take a person and, 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 and let, let's say their, their heart, okay, right now, the heart of Africa town is where most of the people live, and that's pretty much uh, two neighborhoods at Plateau and Magazine, okay? And that's, that's where the, the people live, but you got the rest of the body, which is still Africa town. Uh, near, near the shoulders and the head is a lot of industry, but then that's part of the body that was just torn down. We got to rebuild it back up called Happy Hill. That's an area that really is open for, for creativity. It, 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 it's, it's one of the largest area of co community that's, that's available for creativity. They've torn down the projects and moved the people out, so it's available to be uh, developed any kind of way you want. It. And that's what we're hoping uh, uh, a lot of the design competition is gonna come into play. But 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 what you have with Africa Town, Africa Town is not just the community. Uh, Africa Town is the story itself. It's the story itself, it's a tr tremendous story. And so we, we what we have done, we've got about 35 sites in and around Africa Town. And if I take you from site to site to site to site, about a three hour trip, I'll tell you the whole story of Africa Town. Yeah. I'll tell you where they first started, where they first landed, even though the Clotilda didn't land, a place called Clotilda landed, where they first stayed, uh, where, they, where, they, where they communed, the slave quarters, uh, uh, where, where they fish, where they hunt, the happy hunting grounds, uh, 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 Lewis quarter, where, where, where uh, Lewis moved his family over on this side uh, after they had incorporated. I tell you the whole story of Africa Town in 35 sites about a three hour trip. And, yeah, and, and, and to Joe and, and Renee's point, and we go back to, to Dr. Robinson's informants for her, for her book, um, the folks in, in Africa town are leading the way on ritualistically what's going to be satisfactory in terms of tourism, what's going to be satisfactory in terms of ritual. Yes. You know, the mm -hmm. Blue Way folks are doing festivals under the bridge. Yes. Right? The descendants are doing um, activities connected to the school. Freezing up on this. So those those go back to the to the to, to the and who are doing the work today. So. the community values and, and what's going to be appropriate. At one point in time, some really interesting community fathers wanted to put a roller coaster in Africa town. Well, that was unacceptable. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's not what we're talking about when we're talking about right. tourism. Right. I don't, I, think, I, I don't even think we're talking about duck boats. No. <laughs> well, go ahead, Jason. No. Uh, you, what we're talking about, uh, Nicholas and uh, Rosalie, we're talking about our home. I think when you have so many silos that are coming up with ideas that are not from Africatown and don't realize that there is a percentage of us 
uh, that have left Africa Town or that are still there, that still have family homes. Like both of my grandparents' homes are still there. My mother's grandparents and my father's grandparents' homes are still there. And those of us who have gone on to be CEOs and graduates and things of that nature, it's still home. So if Nicholas, imagine if you will, you went back to your family home and you saw three people standing on your family property making decisions without you having any input in it. And so what essentially I think number one really has to happen is this design competition will begin to give a strong draw to those of us who left and kind of shrugged our shoulders at the hopelessness that Joe was talking about that, have, that has been suppressing our community for years, right? We've seen our grandparents and our parents literally die from the industrialization and the environmental injustice that have gone on there. And so if we're coming back, if Renee is having a conversation with you about there should be an economic and architectural plan that should happen for Africatown, and she's saying that now, well, we're about two decades behind an eight ball on it, right? I mean, Jesse Jackson and John Lewis used to come with delegates from Benin in the 80s to Pritchard and Africatown <coughs> for about a week or two long, uh, economic empowerment slash you name it. And the lawyers and the senators and the people that had the wherewithal to do that, you just saw a CNN special about the Donaldson case and they were the leaders that actually put legislation in place. And so this isn't coming down to dealing with those silos. We have to have a level of respectability to our home that says, not only does these silos that's out malingering and coming up with these ideas don't have just claim to come in and do it, but uh, you, know, you have uh, some key gatekeepers that are on this call right now that have to, uh, they have to have the economic empowerment and the tenacity of people like yourself to pump this story out in a way where not only, uh, no, this is not gonna happen again and not here, but Africa Town really is self-sustaining within itself. It tells its own story. The okay. fact that it remains and that school is built on Rosenwald property and the only one still standing, the, one of the only key places that Booker T. Washington brought his principal down to Isaac J. Whitley and students from that school went on to do great things. You can name five people from that school that are international names. Now, put that in perspective. That means that per capita for famous people and household names in that five square miles, those people were taught and nurtured in that community. And so when we're having this conversation, we have to come from a stance of we're one, talking about our home, two, how do we get the draw through this competition to pull talent back that have left or that are descendants of the descendants that can just come in and do it? We don't need any help. We don't need any help. We just need an assist in getting the story in the right minds and ears that have the wherewithal and care to give respect to what's there. We're, we'll slowly start coming back. People like myself will slowly start coming back and saying, I, not today. And that's really what's gonna happen. This, this design competition and the people that's on this phone call are gonna pump this out enough till enough big brothers and sisters that's sitting up there and they CEOs and the lawyers. And I got some friends that are doctors and working in Ohio and Nevada and all these places. I'm gonna convict them and say, no, nah, come back because my grandmama's house needs your attention. And if they come back and pay attention to grandmama's house, they're gonna find out there's some injustices that's been going on that needs to be paid some attention to. Bro, I shave, brother. <laughs> <laughs> that's my cousin, y'all. Yeah, that, 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 that's, 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 yeah, that you know, in, interestingly enough, um, me and Joe, uh, I came back to one of the uh family uh events and we found that we're good, not distant cousins, but actual cousins, and so uh, we can speak confidently about that because there's more than just uh. There are more than things going on that we can see that's piecing this together. We just better sign on to what's going on because the same way nature will eventually dictate what happens on this ball we call earth and all these you know, gases we keep fuming to the air and we think that there's no consequences. Uh, air, does, air knows no borders and water knows no borders. And so you can't 
ignore one side of town and then not eventually leak over. Mm -hmm. And so, the, you know, like I said, the hope is that we have enough people that this gets their attention just to return and see what's going on so that we can get back to business and usual in Africa town. And when I say business and usual, these people were six to 19 years old and created this community after about five years of being enslaved. When you really sit back and think about that, you, you will be very confident that all we need is time and opportunity to get this done. And that's all we're waiting on. So that seems like a very strong point on which to conclude the call. Again, this has been a, a remarkable um, bringing together of all kinds of richness and, and layers and complexity and information. And I thank you so, so much. And um, we will continue with you um, if you <laughs> hope we can all work together somehow and yes. um, more to come. Renee or Vicky, um, any any last words? Just want to thank the um, Architectural League of New York for doing the original shout out, mm -hmm. this nationwide call to put editorial teams together to look at poverty in rural communities and what we need to do to make them thrive. Thank you for choosing uh, Africa Town because it's really at the cusp of something grand that could happen, but it's not just about saving the <laughs> ship. We're gonna have to have major investments into the rehabilitation and revitalization of Africatown. From the rebuilding of sidewalks, you can't have walking tours if your sidewalks are made. So all of these things are quite uh, connected and all we really need is an economic development plan and a capital improvements plan because the community has already made their complete shopping list of what they want in the Africa Town uh, neighborhood plan. We just need dollars committed to actually take care of, you know, some pretty mundane stuff mm -hmm. uh, in terms of community building. And we're hoping that, you know, the um, Clotilda will leverage interest and the competition will begin to talk about three dimensional ways in which imaginations can, can happen. Um, on behalf of Move Gulf Coast and my board members, I saw a couple of them on the call. I wanna thank you for this absolutely fabulous opportunity to uh, share this vision that we've had and we've been cultivating for a while. Thank you um, to Renee for answering the call when we sent out saying, you know, we got this, this crazy idea, what can you do? But most importantly, I wanna thank Joe uh, I think, Joe, I met him when I was with the NAACP, and the, one of the first meetings I went to was uh, looking at the environmental injustices that uh, Africatown was dealing with at the time. And that's how I first met Ramsey and, and, and all the folks there. And, they have, and um, I just want to thank you guys for embracing this, uh, me personally, um, and, and bringing me into chess and organizational structures of Africatown uh, and embracing this competition. Joe was the first one that gave us the platform to say uh, the community says yes to the competition. He set that up for us. Uh, I want to thank Jason, this young man. I just I just saw him and I said, you know, this is a future leader of Africa Town right here. And I'm thinking, I couldn't have thought of a better person to, to travel with me to Africa. And I have to tell you the whole story one day about how that came to be. But I just I just sense a, a certain sense of um, synchronicity here, and the universe is smiling on us, and the finding of the ship. None of this stuff is con is, is accidental. None of it is. So I think all of us are here for a reason. We're bringing our best games to this table. And everybody has the same purpose, and that is to see this community thrive and to see it grow, but to also see it as the beacon of what can happen, I think, with Black communities across the country. I have a saying, I've told people this before, and I've noticed this when I was reporting at the Birmingham News, you know, it seems like every major movement of Black people always seems to start in Alabama. You look at, you look at Montgomery, you look at Birmingham, you look at Selma, and to a certain degree, Tuskegee. And when I first came home, I remember there was a gentleman, a friend of mine who told me, he said, the next movement is going to happen here in Mobile. I'm thinking, Mobile. But, and he did mention Africa Town, but now that I think about it in the history and what this story means and, the, and all the multiple layers are involved in this from uh, what happened in the past, from the Africans themselves going back to Africa. I mean, there's, there's, there's so many connections here that I really, I'm so full, I can't really explain it all. But all I'm saying is this is the pebble that's being dropped in the water today. And this is going to have ripples for generations. I tell Jason all the time, your sons, and your children's children are going to be talking about this day and what we did here today and what we're going to be doing and have already done because something is being set in motion that we don't really understand. 
But once it goes forward and we look back 20 years now and see what, what has started, we will say that God is really in the details. And, and thank you for all of you guys, especially Renee, for organizing all these crazy thoughts that we had and making it sing and dance and, and jump and skip and do the thing it do, <laughs> you know? And, and, to, and to all the people who, who are gonna really benefit from this, I'm so excited. It's always my heart to serve and to be of, of use and, and, and of, of service to the people, especially my people who have been through so much and Deborah Plant almost had me in tears and, I, and I've been cried about a lot of things that have happened. But whatever God is doing now, whatever's about to happen, y'all put your seatbelts on. It's about, it's about to lock and pop. And we are going to see things that we never thought we would see before. And it's going to be a beautiful thing. And I'm just so thankful and honored to be a part of you, of this group. And thank you so much, uh, American Roundtable editors. You have made that thing sing and dance and shine and pop. And you're just going to look like you're the smartest people on the planet. Thanks. So thank you. And to the essayists who put their hearts into this. Uh, um, Nate, who didn't, who, who wasn't on the call today, Miss Ruth wanted to be in, but she got um, something came up and she wasn't able to be on the call. And Anderson Flynn, the founder of the uh, Africa Talent Pres uh, uh, well, uh, actually Anderson Flynn, Joe, and Miss Ruth are the, the co-founders of the Africa Town Heritage Preservation Foundation. Uh, really want to give a shout out to a lot of people, but we, uh, we, there'll be names and somebody's going to be mad. So just look at the acknowledgements page. Yes, you'll, you'll see your name in there somewhere because we thought we, we thought trying to thank everybody we could think of. But most important, thank you to the American Roundtable and to the Architectural League for giving us this absolutely wonderful opportunity. Thank you so very much. Amen. <laughs> thank you all. Onward, and everybody have a great rest of the afternoon and a great weekend. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Rosalie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Bye. Thank you all. Love everybody. Bye-bye.